Hey, let's start the show. For Thursday, for, uh, Friday, October 14th, 2022, welcome to This Is Only It's Us, the official podcast of Tested. Do my ears deceive me? Do my eyes deceive me? I'm looking at the Zoom screen right now, and I see I see me. I see Kishore Hari. I am here. And no, I see... <laughs> no better person to do this with this week. And I see one <laughs> Jeremy Williams, the prodigal podcaster, returns. You've been back before, but welcome back again. I agree. Jeremy. There is nobody better to do this with than Kishore. <laughs> absolutely right. Uh, you know, Jeremy, you're the only one whose setup can indicate the time recording this. Is that it, it, true? It looks, it looks evening. It looks like it's evening. It's in the evening. Yeah. yeah if you're watching the video. Yeah. You guys have been recording in the evening. You guys are totally throwing me for a loop. I know, we used I know. to do this with coffee in hand, fresh out of bed, ready to go, hit this podcast running. And now we're doing it at 845 at night. Yeah, we do I, I it now with... with beers and it's a very after dark <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> I, I do it half asleep more delirious uh but you know we, we get through it all um right. jeremy i i see uh, first of all welcome back jeremy it's been great oh, to, yeah. great to see you it's like no, no time has gone by this is great oh my god yeah no time has i mean uh, it's only been another another connect another this another second meta connect has gone by right or the first meta connect i guess they just called it connect last year right yeah. And the third is this the third virtual connect? It must be right. Twenty, yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The third. Will we ever go back to San Jose? I don't know. Oh, I was thinking about that. I was thinking about the great times. You know, not just like the the old old days when it was smaller and it was you know the DK one days, but even like post Rift and the launch of Quest One at San Jose uh, Convention Center when when Oculus Connect was going on. It was great to see people. It's good to have like eat lunch and Michael Abrash was just sitting there, you know, eating lunch and, and chatting with folks and John Carmack in the hallways. But anyway, let's not get to nostalgia just yet. I want to give a shout out to you. It's it's, it's been a while. Uh, and I don't think we've had you on the show since California Extreme, Jeremy. And then what That's makes me right. think of that is you're wearing the T-shirt of Small Change Arcade, uh, a local purveyor of uh, half scale. Oh my gosh! I, that's a good question. I think they're half scale. They're not third scale. We did a video with him. I should know this, uh, but since then you guys worked with him to make a an, an ar- ar- a real arcade cabinet. Oh my gosh. Last time I was on, I couldn't even, our product hadn't even been announced. But if you watched that episode, look at my shirt. <laughs> oh, nice. Uh, nice. It, we announced after, soon after that episode that we were working on the Atari 50th anniversary collection. And as a part of that, I had the honor and privilege of making from scratch my own Atari game, very much in the vein of the 1970s Atari, where engineers were told by Nolan Bushnell, go make a game, make your game, and come and show it to me in three months. And so very much like that, that's what I did, that's what my coworkers did, Dave and Jason and, and Mike, we all did that, and it was wonderful. And the game I made... I was, I'm so proud of, I turned into, I, I hired Matt from Small Change Arcade to turn into a full-fledged arcade cabinet. And I, it brought it to California Extreme. People had a blast playing it. There's footage online. You can find it. Just search for Vector Sector California Extreme, and you can see the cabinet. And uh, yeah, that's, that's the whole product is coming out next month, so you'll be able to pick it up on the Switch, Xbox, PlayStation, PC, whatever you want. Very cool, but it's been a great, great life changing experience. I have loved but it. We it's- had been podcasting together for what, like six, seven years now, maybe longer than that, Jeremy. Like, I can't imagine a like a bigger dream of yours becoming a reality. Yeah, Pull, pulling together an entire arcade cabinet, especially one that's based off of uh, Atari classics. The game, hey, 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 Mike. Let's, let's not let's not knock Star Lords. Star Lords was also a. <laughs> full blown arcade cabinet pulled together out of thin air, out of the mind of of you, Jeremy, and Sean Charlesworth and the team of Other Ocean for your work there. Uh, but and, yes, 
and kindly funded by Tested.com. <laughs> yes, that's right. So, that's right. <laughs> uh, Star Lords was a was a great experience too. It was, but I and I loved. I think you know, there's some great LED effects on that cabinet. I'm very proud of them. But that will always be Mike's game. Uh, he and Kevin made the game, whereas we we made uh, Sean made an incredible cabinet, one of the greatest arcade cabinets ever conceived. Um, and I, you know, I did the LEDs and control stuff, but this was my game. So this was a little different for me. It was a, you know, taking the lead and and actually coming up with the writing the code, coming up with the concept, doing the transitions, doing the testing, you know, the iterations. And it was it's awesome. It, it's based on old Atari vector games such as Asteroids, Lunar Lander, and uh, it's it turned out really well. I'm really happy with it. I don't want to spoil anything. I think people are going to have to play this for themselves. Of course, the it's got the 50th anniversary compilation, right? So it's all a uh, ton of the old games, uh, plus the new ones you mentioned that uh, individuals on the team made, kind of took their own approaches and yeah. paid homage to the classics. And uh, yeah, from what, what I've been able to see and, and what the folks at California Extreme were able to see, uh, not just a labor of love, but a genuinely good game in itself. The Atari 50th, man. We're real proud of it. Can't wait to, for the public to see it. It's only a few weeks away now. Oh, amazing. Perfect timing. And of course, perfect timing as well for us to dive into. But well, we have like one big story that we're going to cover this week, all the news and analysis and product uh, out of the MetaConnect conference that, uh, or conference, you know, the keynote and some of the virtual panels that took place this past Tuesday. It's a little bit of technology news, but stay tuned uh, for the second half of the show. We're going to have some uh, some big news to talk about as well. Uh, but usually I ignore Norm when he tells me to stay to the end of a, of a video or a podcast. But this time, I think you should listen. to them. Yes. Seconded. Listen, don't, sk don't, don't skip. Don't skip this upcoming section because <laughs> it's going to take a little more than a minute. The VR Minute, virtual reality this week. Okay, where do you guys want to begin with MetaConnect? Because it's, we a, had done it's a rare thing when you start the show with the VR Minute, and I, I love it. I yeah. love it. <laughs> so we leading up to it, Kishore, you and I had done our, our speculation. We had, you know, we kind of... Uh, a lot of the information, we've, we've talked about some of the leaks that were out there, uh, but there are still questions that were not known. And what I couldn't say last week was, you know what? I couldn't say, I actually could not say it last week because at the time that we recorded the podcast last week, I had not done, not yet went to Meta to go hands-on with the Quest Pro. And that was the big thing that was announced. So should we start off with the hardware? Do you want to go with like the, the bigger, the macro picture about what this conference meant for Meta and what do you think they were trying to accomplish? No way. Mean, we talk about the hardware. <laughs> this, okay, let's talk about the hardware. Okay, so it's the Meta Quest Pro, you know, just as we may have seen someone at a hotel unbox, do a, an informal unboxing of and, and some... Uh, overzealous developers maybe sharing some, some images of or maybe resolve from some of the blurry pixelated images that Zuckerberg himself shared. Uh, it is their high-end VR headset. And by high-end, I mean price very high, $1,500 VR headset. Uh, they call it a VR headset. It's not an augmented reality headset. It's, not, it's a VR headset with mixed reality features uh, and, uh, aimed at, I think, probably unsurprisingly, the enterprise market. And shipping available pre order now and shipping uh, later this month on October 25th. So I, I did a whole video with the impressions and the tech specs. We can run down some of the features. I'm curious about maybe from your guys' perspective, what was the, the flagship feature? I, I would start with the color pass through. Okay. Uh, just because I'm so used to the pass through on the Quest 1 and 2. Um, and that being pixelated and and a high degree of latency we finally have color pass through and a lot of the software announcements maybe not a lot but a few of the software announcements really rely on the pass through to really you know function and uh and uh and go and so i know you didn't get to try everything that was announced in terms of the pass through but what were your initial takeaways from the from the pass through is this good enough or is this v1 
It's absolutely V1. Uh, but I, I think that's, I mean, good enough. What, what is the bar for good enough? Is it as clear and uh, are images in the environment around you resolved as clearly as uh, a optical pass-through system? No, absolutely not. Is it clear enough that I could see someone's face and see my environment and know where my phone is, know where my coffee cup is and make eye contact, uh, quote unquote, eye contact with someone in the same room? Yes, I would say sufficient for that. Uh, is it clearer than the Quest 2? Much clearer than Quest Crisper than the Quest 2? Is it as sharp as if you've watched some high quality like VR 180 video, like the stuff that you know Meta has put out that's filmed with uh, the, the, the Canon lenses, the 8K video stuff? Not as clear as that. And there's a techno te uh, technology reason for that. Um, but it clearly is their first public attempt at a pass-through system where they can integrate rendered holograms but have a persistent color pass-through uh, in not just the main user interface but in as many applications as developers want to work on. Jeremy, would you say pass-through? That was the big flagship feature for you? No. Um, oh. I'd say going into it, I was most excited about the eye tracking and face tracking because uh, I feel like that's an area that is completely untapped from a consumer standpoint so far. Mm -hmm. And I've seen what eye, eye tracking can do from a social experience, but even more so, I mean, I think from an in point, in input point of view, you can use it to you know, basically as a pointer, you can activate things by staring at them, or you can, you know, essentially look at something and then a button press can become activate for that thing or lob a grenade in that direction, or your, your aim becomes better if you're staring in a certain direction for a certain period of time. There's so many new things you can do from an input standpoint with eye tracking. I'm excited about that. Um, but after watching the event and seeing the price, uh, I don't know to what extent that's really going to become utilized by developers. Uh, you know, if they're talking about a $1,500 headset and we know that the Quest 2 has sold very well, they're going to continue to sell that and they're rumored to have the Quest 3 coming out next year. No, not even rumored. Uh, Zuckerberg's confirmed it. That it's coming uh, so out, but not next year. Not next this year. year is what next he said. year. Right. Is that what is that? Next, what he said... said I don't think he said next year. He said not this year. Okay. I don't know if he said next okay. year. Well, well, at very least, I expect to hear more about it next year. And yeah. if they're teasing it, if they're saying that it exists, yes. they're, they're essentially telegraphing to people, yeah, okay, if, if the $1,500 headset isn't for you, hold tight. You know, We got the, the Quest 3 on the way. So yeah. the people will hold out for it. My, yeah. the, the point is sales of this will not be you know, stratospheric. So if, yeah. if there isn't going to be a huge installed base, I don't know what incentive there will be for developers to support all these great new features. Uh, in which case, really the thing that I look forward to most, and I cannot justify buying one of these things, and yet I've done it anyway, <laughs> is the pancake lenses. Yeah. Uh, ergonomics. Got I'm it. most excited about that comfort. Uh, and I and I understand it's it's heavier than a Quest 2, but it's got, it's more symmetrically balanced with the battery in the back yeah. and just that and not even like the flatness of it although i think that that's i assume that that feels better in some respect uh just from a momentum standpoint swinging the thing around but the uh the focus the area of focus that you have from pancake lenses is apparently much wider Carmack described being able to read text by scanning his eyes as opposed to having to move your head to move where you would normally with a Quest 2 with, you know, the standard lenses that we have now, you would have to move like the your headset around to scan text and keep it in focus. Whereas now with pancake lenses, it's possible to do that just by moving your eyes around. So I'm I'm super stoked to for to experience that because that applies to everything. And, and I think those things all uh, support one another. When you're talking about designing a lens where the trade-offs are thickness, weight, uh, field of vision, but also clarity across uh, the entire field of view, the expanded sweet spot, it's obvious that they wanted to do that because that's going to pair with the eye tracking. If you're going to encourage eye tracking to be a mode of input, a mode of sensing, and content not just to be focused in the center of the screen, but for content to be all around the field of view, then you got to have lenses where it's going to be clear 
across a field of view. Uh, those things work in tandem, I think, or complement each other. Uh, same with, I think, the, uh, the face and eye tracking with the pass-through. That's all in the sensor package. So you know, to go through some of the, the, the specs and the speeds and feeds, um, one of the primary differences uh, in this is there are now 10 sensors on the headset itself, 10 camera systems. We're on the Quest 2, there are four, primarily all for inside out tracking, right? There's four cameras on the front. If you look at the, the corners of a Quest 2 are used so it can track the world, uh, and the position of the headset, and also the position of the controllers. And that's where you have the, the occlusion being a, an issue or the controller is behind your back and the in, uh, inadequacies of that kind of inside out tracking system versus a, uh, a, a beacon based system, a a base station based system, which technically is inside out. I know uh, because it's still sensors reading lasers, uh, but certainly the lasers are all around you 360. Uh, the, I want to go back to the pass through system because one of the things I learned is the way, and I want to I explain how the pass through system works because there are five sensors now, five cameras now on the, uh, on the front of the headset. Uh, you have two cameras on the side, right? And then there are three cameras around the nose. The two cameras on the side, that's for inside out tracking. Two of the cameras on the, uh, the, the nose, also for inside out tracking, looking down, um, potentially looking at your hands, hand tracking as well. But that fifth camera, that's, uh, and there's also a depth sensor as well, which is new. There's a depth sensor in here uh, that's not just using st uh, depth, stereo depth you know, analysis. It actually is a, an IR depth sensor. And then there's a RGB sensor that takes a flat video at high, high-ish resolution and then superimposes that, reconstructs it on the geometry, uh, the projection of the world that the SLAM system is computing. So uh, kind of like if you're in the Quest 2 right now and you're drawing your guardian, you see like this warped, bended, grayscale render of the world of the, of the video over some geometry and it's not just pixelated but it's kind of squiggly as well as yep. maybe as a way to describe it yep uh this there's less of that squiggly because it's a more accurate uh mesh that they've created uh and fat and a faster refresh rate i believe and it's also sharper because it's a higher resolution rgb but it's a, it's a i believe a mono rgb that's then superimposed um, and it gives you on top of the stereo images. Yeah, super smart. Yeah. Uh, so it's not like a VR 180 camera where it's two wide angle lenses um, and that, that's creating a stereo. Cause then that doesn't work if you tilt your head, if you, if you, you know, if you, if you rotate your head um, along uh, your neck axis, VR video just breaks completely. It needs to be a reconstruction, it needs to be video overlaid on top of uh, geometry. Yeah, it's. I mean, this kind of thing is amazing that it's being done in real time. I mean, that, that, that's the kind of thing that people just take for granted. We get, oh, they put cameras on the front, so of course I can see through it. But no, this is this is not just like feeding it raw camera footage through. It's it's like you're saying it's a remapping of a black and white, you know, stereo, you know, three dimensional, you know. It's I don't trying even know what to, to call recreate it. your <laughs> eye. Yeah, it, and it's, it's, it's and right. where your eyes are. Like it's not yeah. doing the thing where it's like putting the cameras where the pupils would be, because that doesn't always work because your right. IPDs of everyone yeah. is different. So stereo, they're, they're gonna have to, you know, realign and kind of uh, 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 restitch your left and right eye anyway. So uh, this is just solves that by kind of bypassing it and mapping video over geometry. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, the eye tracking stuff. Interesting as well. It's three sensors on the inside of the headset for your eyes, IR sensors above the nose bridge. There is a you know, calibration um, uh, interface that to go through to onboard with every user. Uh, and then the face tracking stuff, which interestingly refreshes at a lower refresh rate than the eye tracking because they don't need to you know, do it 72 times a second. Uh, two cameras there. Uh, and that takes video data and internally on the headset extrapolates that into 70 data points, which is then shared with developers. Uh, and that's where the, you get instant camera rigging of your face. I really hope that that technology advances in the same way that we saw hand tracking advance on the Quest 2, you know, which wasn't even there in launch. It, it became a thing later on, and it was this amazing new capability. And I, and I would love to see 
what they you know uh, are testing behind the scenes in their laboratories on their what do they call them like a uh, Codec avatars, Codec avatars yeah, yeah. where the, it's really photographic. It looks like a person. You know, I don't expect it that to get to that fidelity, but something closer to that than what they've demonstrated they can do is some is kind of what I was hoping we would see from this device. I mean, the, for such a lot more money, I kind yeah. of expected that the, this hallmark feature of face and eye tracking to mean that they could bring me into virtual reality in a way that I haven't seen yet. Right. That and feels what we're a little now, hollow decky in I, of you though. Yeah, yes. To expect I, that. At fifteen hundred, that feels aggressive to me. But I and get on the timeline the and desire. across timeline. Right. Yeah. It's, you know, like, well, yes, we all and, and the glimpses we saw in the past two years have been magical of the codec avatars. Uh what we're getting though are just kind of the more advanced version of the Facebook avatars or the meta avatars, right? Where they're still cartoonish. They're a little more detailed in the previews that were shown of what they're shipping next year. Uh, but rather than what we've had to settle for before, which is the faking of social cues where developers abstracted based on audio cues, based on directionality randomness. in the head, yeah. randomness, right? Keep alive animations, but like, they would lock eyes. Yeah. If you were looking at someone and they could detect, okay, they're probably talking to each other because one person's looking at the other and one person is, audio's coming out and the microphone's getting data. So then they're lock eyes and blink. And uh, that, that I know for you, Jeremy, especially, because we've tried podcasting in VR, and that was a tough thing for you to, to, to stomach. And you would always see through that. I think the eye tracking is going to be great. Yeah, I mean, for social stuff, as long as people support it. I mean, I hope, you know, like I say, it comes down to incentive at this kind of price point. I mean, clearly there's, we haven't gone into the rest of the conference, but this is this device is not marketed to gamers. This is device is marketed towards people who want to work remote and have an in-the-office kind of experience, at least as much as they can. And so eye, eye contact is going to be a big part of that, just as it could be in games like Rec Room or big screen. Um, but, uh, you know, I, you need to have <laughs> me having the device does nothing for me. You know, you having the device does. And <laughs> yeah. that's, that's a really good point. Cause it's, it's an asymmetrical relationship right. where when you talk about hand tracking and hand tracking and, you know, feet tracking, which we'll get to, uh, needs to be precise because if any extra latency, any mismanagement of the IK systems is going to break presence, break immersion for yourself because that's your body. With the face, even if you're looking into it, maybe if you're looking into a mirror and it's there's latency that can break immersion, but you're not looking at your own face all the time. Like latency, minor inaccuracies is not going to break immersion for you. That's sort of for the benefit of everyone else. I think you're also talking about just the the feeling of persistence presence, which we none of us have really felt a, an extended version of that. But for the use cases they were talking about, like being out on an oil rig or like supporting somebody that's like doing training in a in a manufacturing warehouse, like I don't think the eye tracking at the kind of fidelity you're talking about is going to be necessary for those early use cases, at least the ones they listed. To get to the part where like there's real positive, meaningful VR social interactions, absolutely. But I'm not sure we need photo realism before we before we uh, uh, get there. What you know, one question I had at this price point, and this is actually I think my biggest disappointment with the headset is is the LCD screen instead of an OLED screen because that tech is there. Like, well, it's an, it's an, it's an, it's an LCD screen with local dimming. So you've got the potential to have large swaths of black, although you won't be able to get star fields that are lit against a black pixels, sky. Right. Yeah. Right. Pixels. So it's like, it, it, it'll have, you know, it's strong, you know, points and weaknesses, but it's, uh, I, I'm, I'm not terribly worried about it. I mean, I've, I, in my experience with VR has been every headset delivers it's just different you know when you get in there whatever the darkest value it can deliver is becomes black and yeah so don't you, watch you game of thrones in this but outside of that you can <laughs> yes. do whatever you want right i mean i know people and i remember the old oled screens and they're they're great they're great but uh 
I, I I trust them to have done the right thing here. Even Carmack said, yeah, it's true. The OLEDs gave us great blacks, but once you went up from there, this low range of brightness was very difficult to deal with. Um, and it yeah. didn't resolve that terribly well. So it's like there, there's pros and cons. And, and my bigger, maybe not disappointment, but like the thing I value more than even like the perfect pitch black of OLED pixels uh, is the the brightness and the range of yeah. brightness from zero to two fifty five. And and I don't, I'm not asking for full hundreds of thousands of nits of brightness in HDR, but even looking at the give kind of me brightness, a tan with this headset. <laughs> but even like a thousand nits of brightness, you know, the, the yeah. kind of what, what you'd see on a. a an OLED TV or, or a nice Q, uh, QLED TV these days. Um, we're not, it doesn't look like we're going to get as much dynamic range in this. And that's because that would require a whole different processing layer. And so much of this, including the resolution of these displays, uh, is tied to backward compatibility. And this fundamentally being a Quest 2 plus extra features. Uh, but it's going to run the same apps as the Quest 2. Developers, you know, there are an estimated 10 million Quest 2s out there, and developers are only going to be incentivized to develop if they have the Quest 2 as a base platform with them, the however many uh, Quest Pro users out there end up on this this new uh, this new device. And I think going back to that the avatars question, Rec Room is a great example where it's a system that developers already invested in their style of avatars. It's a kind of iconic or unique to to their game because it's also cross platform uh, and it'll be they, they will have less incentive financially to add engineering to for eye tracking and face tracking because uh, they don't know how many people are going to buy the Quest Pro. And that's why I think what Meta wants is for people to adopt and developers to adopt their avatar system and just make it a plug and play that's scalable. Right. So you just use whatever the users already designed and character created from themselves in the main UI, in the home menu system. Uh, and then if it has eye tracking, great, it works. If it doesn't, it'll fall back to some abstractions. I want to push back a little bit on this accusation of being too holodecky for a minute. First of all, <laughs> don't accuse me of wanting the future too badly. Okay, I am a growing man <laughs> and I want it now. I do want it now. Um, but more immediately, like they need to make a virtual reality interaction as compelling as a Zoom call is central to their pitch here. They want people to go into the metaverse to engage with their coworkers and communicate in a way that you can't over Zoom. And I don't think you're going to get there until you have great eye, like not just eye tracking, but face mapping. You know, where you can really bring my expressions and responses into the uh, into the avatar, into the 3D world. And so that's that's what I want. That's what, I, it is why I want it. Slide I agree those microaggressions, right? I want yeah. my microaggressions to fully be extrapolated into yes. macroaggressions. Right. <laughs> so I agree with that. I I think what I'm pushing back against is that there needs to be photorealism for that kind mm -hmm. of interaction to happen. And I, I just don't think that's the case. I think there's a way that you can still use an avatar based system and create that, that sense. Yeah. It, it, it's going to be like a kind of a funky avatar system, but like, I don't think I need to see the wrinkles on some at somebody's eyes, mm. like when they're laughing, but I need to be able to see the shift in their, in their, in their face when they are laughing in yeah. some way. I didn't see that based on what I saw so far. So that's why I'm saying right. I hope yeah, that that technology fair. evolves. I think the tech is there. It just isn't necessarily in the meta avatars because the alien mirror demo that I tried, yeah, it was it was like a Pixar animation, you know, and, and I, I use that just as an example to say, you know, it was like a high quality studio animation. Not only did it look like a high quality render, but it was expressive as hell. Oh, that yeah. is really reassuring. I'm really glad to hear that. Like, like it scrunches and wrinkles and like, and, and, and like a brow movement and cheeks, not just like, uh, like a huff and a puff. Like I could, I, I felt like, um, you know, like an animator almost. Like yeah. I was trying to go through all these like zany DreamWorks style faces and I was capturing all those. And I could also, uh, they, they made transparent a, a menu for me to exaggerate certain things. So it could tone down 
you know, parts of your expressions or really exaggerate parts of your expressions. And these are all, we've saw a little bit of like, it's, it's almost like the, the hand tracking stuff where, you know, they would kind of give you, give you big hands or octopus hands. And we've seen those demos where, you know, the, the finger tracking can, can be stretched out in ways to make you feel like, you know, they're exaggerated in some sense. You can do that to your face now, uh, or you wouldn't, you will be able to do that to your face. Uh, I think the meta avatars, the default ones, are going to maybe have to find a common ground between that and the Quest 2. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the question is, like, when, that, when, when does the baseline become face tracking, eye tracking, so they can really lean into as expressive as these avatars can possibly be with the tech? Right. Yeah. And it appears that it may not be the Quest 3. And we don't know anything about that product, but the leaks suggest that that is not a feature in the Quest 3, at least in the what's been you know, where leaked. That, where that line is drawn, yeah. 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 And, and it's an interesting point because, yeah, we'll acknowledge there, there are leaks of you know, what purported renders of the Quest 3 with uh, what the camera's systems may look like. And one of the things that I was so curious about is if they are developing two lines of Quest, see? Quest one, two, three, four, five, mainstream line, we'll call it, in that sub five hundred dollar entry point, uh, and a fifteen dollar, fifteen hundred dollar baseline entry point for a pro line, where they draw the difference in the features. Is it in right. pancake lenses? Is it in ergonomics? Is it in processing capabilities? Is it in sensors, uh, pass through, or face tracking? And the in indication was that. They're going to use the developer and user feedback from the Quest Pro after it comes out for them to draw those lines. For in that sense that it was kind of a developer kit, right? Not, not only an enterprise targeted product, but a a way to actually test it in the wild. What are people using? What are the users? Are they only buying games with pass through? Are they only buying games that have face tracking? And then differentiate the lines. And if there are renders of the Quest 3 already, if it is coming out next year, it's too late to change that. Right. Like then we're talking about Quest 4. We're to, I mean, products take years to develop. You know, Cambria was in its this form basically a year ago when they previewed it at at, at, at uh, the last Meta Connect. Hey, now welcome to the wild world of hardware development. It's a completely different animal than the software that the company had been essentially based on for so long yeah what you're describing though really is in line with my hopes actually though because i i got the sense and watching and i i suggest anyone who really followed you know connect check out the interview that mark zuckerberg did with the verge because it was mm -hmm. it shed some light on it that i thought gave it gave a better perspective including the fact that like he did, he thinks of the of the quest pro as a uh, Maybe just one audience is just potentially just people who just want like the finest quest, um, you. <laughs> which happens to be me. Yeah, right. That's why I got it because I want a more comfortable quest that has a few extra bells and whistles. But they don't. They're they're not thinking of themselves as an enterprise company, which was my huge fear after watching Connect. They still are, are focused on consumers, and for whatever reason, this Connect just wasn't for them. Like this was a, an odd Connect in that it was focused on this new high-end device and they're pitching it for businesses. Um, and we'll see if, if that finds a place. I know that they hope it does. And certainly the technology eventually, I think, will get there. I don't know if this is the one that will, you know, crack that ceiling or not. But the the thing that, that he goes into in that interview that I gave me relief and, and calm after watching Connect was <laughs> that... They still are thinking that this is early days, that this is a long-term thing. To me, the Connect event felt more like they were anxious and they needed this device to be mainstream sooner than it was naturally going to get there. And if they really are thinking of this as still early days, we got another, you know, who knows how many years ahead of us before we get to a, a, a billion devices in the hands of consumers. Um, then great. Then maybe it's all right if Quest Three isn't. It maybe the Quest Pro is something they're testing the waters with for quest four for all we know like it could be a long-term thing and it doesn't have to be that every single year we're going to get the game-changing device it may still take a lot of patience and i i think that's the right way to look at it because the the vr industry thought it was going to be a pc vr device <laughs> for the longest time Carmack you look at too you look at the oh, no, investment sorry. the the pr previous ceo carmack was all about mobile 
That's true. No, he was all about the the go. Like he freaking <laughs> yeah, yeah. loved the go. Yeah. Um, you know, and he would go on and on about if if VR was just screens, it would be a magical device. Uh, but but you look at the investment they put in with Insomniac and Ready at Dawn and all these amazing games that came out in the early days of VR for PC VR, like just millions and millions and millions of dollars and like two developer kits, Rift, Rift S. And all of that had to be blown out of the water because it turned out that mobile was where their entire business was. And so they pivoted, they rebooted, and now we're, it's like we almost had to start over again with Quest. And so it is kind of like these lagging early days. And I think it's a, it's a strange thing for us to experience when we've been in it for 10 years and we're ready for it to hit. But it just has, we have to be more patient than, you know, than, than we want to be. The other thing I think that gives reassurance for for gamers that they're not abandoning that mainstream that consumer market is all all the studios they acquired. They acquired six big game studios, You're making from Beat Saber to Population One to to Ready at Dawn, right? To, right? And and uh, uh, to um, uh, what was, what was uh, you know Supernatural, of course, with the fitness stuff. Uh, but yeah, that's it was Onward, right? Developers of Onward, like. That's going to come to fruition. We haven't seen the fruits of those acquisitions yet. Right. I guess. Uh, Senzaru. Uh, Dude, we're yeah, not Senzaru. Even... <laughs> freaking As- Asgard's Wrath was a game that contended for game of the year of all games. Yeah, and I, right. no, like nobody played it because it was so early yeah. in VR. Like a few people played it because they had VR headsets and everything back then. But my God, like I, if if they can bring that to Quest or if that, that team develops something for Quest, it's going to be amazing. But we, yeah. it takes time. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you're just still talking about the game developers they acquired. There's all the hardware groups they acquired along the way too. Mm-hmm. Control Labs, wit, like none of that tech has shown up inside of any of these devices yet. Yep. So yep. like ju- I, like I still think the future is bright for more precise tracking and realism to come. I think uh, there's uh, some big problems with like battery and processing that they are <laughs> going to hit timing is very funny for this and i I think going back to what you're saying jeremy the the elephant in the room and it was explicitly said in that verge interview is is apple is they need to get something that they want businesses and enterprises to be invested monetarily in as a platform before apple is out there with their augmented reality headset, which we all expect is coming and maybe more expensive than 1500. And Apple's not going to make an enterprise only device. They're going to make a high end consumer device. And to, to borrow a phrase from what was said in the keynote, uh, Zuckerberg and co don't want to be fashionably late to, to this. They would rather have the foot in early and kind of set the tone of uh, and expectations because uh, there's going to be parity across i think you know what, what we hope uh in terms of sensors pass through uh face, face tracking these are kind of like fundamental things that anyone who's done research in ar and vr knows has to happen um for these devices to to be useful you know, you know there's another elephant in the room and it's coming from sony and they better watch their back be, uh, at both of these companies because i think the psvr2 is going to surprise a lot of people who aren't paying attention that thing is, they figured out everything they needed to learn with the first draft, and they're coming out guns blazing. Like, this thing is, has things that the, that the place, uh, that the, God, I can't even say the word, the Quest Pro doesn't have, right? And it's going to be a consumer device. It has eye tracking. It has, uh, you know, adaptive triggers. It has head haptics. Uh, uh, it's, you know what I'm saying? Like, they, they figured stuff out, and it's going to be gamer-focused, and running on a PlayStation 5, they don't, they're not relying on a mobile hardware anymore. They have the potential to do foveated rendering, which is going to increase the resolution a little bit for where you're focused. And, I mean, this is, this is going to be the biggest competition Oculus has ever seen from a gaming standpoint. I think they would welcome it. I think they would be so happy if PSVR 2 takes off because that would encourage developers to stick with VR and they don't have to shoulder the responsibility of their hardware carrying an entire unproven early days industry uh and i think if psvr2 fails they are they are they're going to feel like it's not good for the industry as a whole you know what my big fear was is when uh, that fashionably late comment came out i thought they were going to announce the hermes version of the MetaQuest pro <laughs> and i was just like <laughs> it's like oh no 
<laughs> hey, no, no tops trap anymore. No tops trap. Hey, okay. So let's 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 still dive into some of the hardware because there's still a lot of interesting stuff to discuss. Uh, processing uh, was something Kishore you mentioned as being maybe a disappointment or a limitation, and they are sticking with Qualcomm, the Snapdragon XR XR two now plus, plus processor. And the interesting thing here is John Carmack talked about how thermals are really just a, a big problem that has not been solved in headsets and you're not going to get a 4090 you know <laughs> in, in a vr headset because those things are not only consume a ton of uh a power but also put out a ton of heat and even in the mobile chipset in the arm world while well, they acknowledge and boss acknowledge that designing their own silicon has to happen at some point and this isn't their wholly owned silicon the way the M1 chip is for Apple, uh, which is a huge competitive advantage because they can scale that across all the other devices they're already selling, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of phones and laptops and tablets. Uh, Qualcomm has the fabs to, to make something that's more efficient than the way they put up for custom FPGAs for the sensors uh, while still having that compatibility with Plus 2. Uh, yeah, you know what? We haven't talked about the controllers yet, have we? That they're no, self tracking. Yeah, yeah. That's they have a Qualcomm processors themselves. That's a each. big deal. Yeah, like that. Two that's cameras a, in each one, too. How many cameras? Three. Three. Uh, so I think the three cameras in each, I think, is less interesting unless there's something that we haven't heard yet and no developers come out to say, oh, here's something cool about the cameras. You can, in the, the controllers, you know, as, as, a, as a novel interface. Right, like pass through camera from a controller to a viewport oh, in your head. Like, whoa, yeah. I'm saying like that. That's a wild thing. No developer has said that. So right. my assumption is that it's just purely for tracking purposes. Yeah, fine. Uh, more interesting, and that's essential because you no more occlusion. There's a better uh, occlusion for pass through with position, right? So you actually your controllers overlay on top of the video for pass through. You can put controllers behind your head, whatever, whatever. Um, I mean, these are the things that you needed a a, a a Valve headset to solve until now. This is, I think, this is a big deal. It is. I think it's about the input though that got less attention. That's even a bigger deal because not only do you have the same buttons, the ABXY and your thumbstick. Uh, there's now thumb sensit pressure sensitivity on the thumb, and it's still a trigger button and a grip button, but on the trigger button, it's actually, there's a horizontal sensor that allows you, so it's, it's, it's no longer the, uh, the, the analog depression of the mm -hmm. trigger button itself. That animates the hand. You know how the, the, the your Oculus hands always were like. Yes, it would go from like a smooth animation to like a snap to wide open for a fist or a, a wide open. Here, that you can actually map a gentle curl of your index finger over. You're saying it's the capacitive. Button. It's capacitive in itself. In addition to being analog, an analog depression. Cool. Yeah. So uh, that allows for a pinching mechanic. Huh while holding the controllers because you can lift your fingers off of the off of the actual button slowly you know curl it on top of the button do the depression as well as having the thumb pressure and in one of the demos i was able to do it was a jenga game and it was a precise jenga game like hmm. the squeeze of hmm. like it was almost like too precise because i was like shaking almost because it was it was the physics simulation wasn't smoothed out uh, so there's that. There's three ha new uh, or three total new motors now for haptics. So there's one in the base, one in the thumb, and one in the uh, the top. So you get you're gonna get feet like you know, HD haptics for lack of a better phrase uh, for more activities. Neat. And I think that's one of the reasons they went from or that's one of the benefits of not using AA battery is they could use that space for for motors, for actuators, for haptics. Uh, and they are backwards compatible with the Quest 2, which I wasn't expecting. Yeah, and I think some of that is because of the haptics feedback. Some of that is for the better sensing, so you're going to be able to do you know, your wild Beat Saber actions with the Quest 2 headset. And some of that is also the productivity stuff they're pushing so hard. So even if your company may be all Quest 2 enabled right now in some virtual environment, uh, you can now use that Quest Pro controller as a stylus with pressure sensitivity. I um, have to admit, the stylus was the one that lost me. I was like, I can't imagine somebody really using this. It's actually pretty good. It's, it's, it's a feature that's been in workrooms. You, if you, 
when they demoed it and I was like, now hold your Quest 2 controller, but hold it like a pen, the grip part. It, it feels like a fat marker, but with that little nub, your table surface it writes like a pen. Yeah, no, it's the best way to write with a touch controller for sure. <laughs> I mean, there's not like that many ways to do it, but it's uh, I, I've done it on the Quest 2 and I was surprised by how good it works. And with that little tip, that rubber tip, and the pressure sensitivity, and the force sensor on the, the, the base of the controller, it actually, it, it's like having a nice stylus. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine that's pretty But 300 neat. bucks. 300 bucks for the controllers. For the pair, for the which pair. is I think is twice as much as replacement Quest 2 controllers, touch controllers. And, and I guess in line with like replacement index controllers. I mean, those are 250 bucks for, for a pair. Yeah. So still expensive, right? Yeah. Uh, battery life also surprising. So. Yeah. Well, yes and no. I mean, apparently it's you know potentially one to two hours, which does not bode well. But Carmack said in his talk that if you do turn off the special you know pro features, eye tracking, <laughs> face tracking, pass through, uh, pass through, then you'll should last longer than a Quest Two would. It actually has a bigger battery. But yeah. if you're if you're going to be you know using to its full power, it's yeah, it's going to be a short battery life. Yeah, yeah. It's so weird that they, they quoted off that one to two when I guess they want people to use all these features, right? And uh, it's, it has to do with the weight. It has to do with just how how the batteries, where they are, the, these curved batteries now, how they work as a counterbalance, a counterweight, and and that uh, the, the efficiency of the SOC. It's, it's not the latest process that they're using for, for I, heat dissipation. They're always going to struggle with battery with pass-through. Like you can't do that kind of camera technology with it's overlaying things that without costing a lot of uh, battery power. Um, yeah, I'm sure if they did what Apple did and like build their own chips and all that kind of stuff, there'd be some economies ar around battery life. But I, I think it's a uh, it's pretend physics to think that this isn't always in that mode going to consume a ton of battery very quickly. Yeah. I just hope that you can charge while using while it. While playing, yeah. You know, with a with in. a big old fat battery pack that can that can put out the necessary current. I I hope that it can as the Quest Two can. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which yes, you just have to find a, a novel way to mount that external battery now because it's all self contained. You, you lose the tilt. You no longer can tilt the headset. I will miss arm. that. My yeah. my mom. She has a Quest Two. She's had every headset or the mobile ones. She had no idea that even existed. I wouldn't be surprised if most people never use that feature, but I do, and I love it, so I'm going to miss it. And I, I think that's them saying, in the past, you had to do the tilt for clarity on the lens to find a sweet spot. Yeah, that's but true. With the pancake optics, maybe you don't have to do that. Or right. fit. And be, yeah, so eh, uh, to be tested, uh, for sure, when we hopefully get hands-on with it. Uh, double the memory, 12 gigs of RAM, and I think this is an, also a... Uh, understated feature uh this could be a big deal for the for multitasking like if you want to use a vr headset as a general purpose computer right now it still feels like an iphone iphone 4 right, right. Where you don't have real multitasking you have instances of applications uh and with the quest pro you can have a browser running without shutting an application off. yeah that sounds That's interesting I, I agree with you i think that this 12 gigs has gone under you know, explored by the press since the event. I, I think I, I think just the whole thing should feel more responsive. You know, when you're launching and getting back to certain things, going to the, back to the dock, back into a game is potentially going to be much faster. It's a battery. Also, more memory. It's a battery. Yeah. Uh, ergonomics. I'll tell you, it was really comfortable. It was so comfortable, guys. Yes, it weighs more. Uh, the way you put it on, it'll take a little getting used to because there's no bend, so it's not the stretchy of the visor. You, you, you loosen it and put it on. I said like a crown, is what mm -hmm. the developer said. That's very apt. It has the light bleed, so by default, you you see the world, and that's them leaning into the pass through video. And so you know the the synchronization, the matching of where your real arm is to where it shows up in headset is perfect, uh, and. Uh, it has, you know, uh, uh, these magnetic light blockers for the sides that you can attach, which I didn't get to try, but they fit my glasses so well, like really perfectly and, and didn't push push them against my face at all. Like it's very comfortably 
put on. Did you I think, think I was yeah. sorry, go ahead. How would you compare the comfort to something like the index? Much more comfortable. No Much, kidding. And I think it's a combination of the you have to credit the pancake optics. It's the pancake optics one that you just no longer have a bulk of a thing. Yeah. Even two and a half inches away from your eyes. That extra whatever the distance is that is reduced, uh, and the battery being in the back by default. So yeah, we've had counterweighted headsets in the past before, but like on the Quest 2, you still have the battery in the front if you had a battery in the back. Here, the battery being in the back, the front just no longer feels like it's straining your nose bridge. You have a, um, a headrest that it mounts on, and that's adjustable too. Hmm. So you uh, you didn't miss the the custom. Um... Uh, prescription lenses because you have those for your quest two. i do right? yeah yeah and it's because you know normally if i i use it and i have weird weird vision anyway uh where one of my eyes is, is perfect uh it's being having the glasses like i'm just gonna it, it's i've had i've used a bunch of headsets before where the glasses technically fit in and when they they kind of fit even like the life vive pro it's when I take the headset off because it's a full gasket, the glasses sometimes come out along with the headset, right? Or it's going to fog up on the inside. And here is just easy on, easy off. And I think it's going to be a big deal for them hoping for people at a desk who just need to pop the headset on to see a virtual object, to analyze a, a 3D model or to jump into a virtual you know, telepresence, virtual meeting that's with pass-through. Like They just want people taking these on and off, charging it, put them on, use it. Not necessarily in it for you know six hours at a time, but having it as um, as like as if you look be looking at a tablet, you know, or or a phone. Uh, it's a thing that you pick up and put on and use. This is going to sound a little silly, but there's something I wear my glasses all day. There's something about the weight of the glasses on my face that makes it feel normal to me. And when I hmm. don't have my glasses on, even with the prescription lenses in my Quest. It never feels quite right. And so I was weirdly excited about that feature. <laughs> I forgot my glasses were still on. I went to look for my glasses on a side table uh, after taking the headset off, as I would have done at any other demo, and they were still on. Like That muscle memory completely forgot. How is the sound quality compared to Quest 2? Noticeably better. What? And the first demo I was put in uh, was uh, the Tribe XR. So the DJing, it's like, has a whole deck that's simulated. Uh, they have like a Guitar Hero rock band style, you know, follow along the icons. And I wasn't very good at that, but it sounded really good. I that's, mean, that's, I mean, it's still the same kind of yes. sound delivery mechanism, right? Yeah, yeah. Holes in the arms. Right. <laughs> but the arms are solid. And I think the placement of those holes. Because uh, in the quest, it's by default there there are no arms, right? So it's a, right, it's soft strap. It's soft strap. So here, because the arms are fixed, the placement of it is more directly over your ears. Okay, above your ears. Nice. This yeah. is very good to hear. I didn't know that. Yeah. Not as good as the index. They're not speaker. Well, come right? on, but it's, yeah. it sounded. Like, I was surprised. I asked him like, "Wow, the I, I, like it was a noticeable thing." That's great. In that demo, uh, three microphones and two headphone ports. So they will like in was it the Quest One. That they had two uh, two yep. headphone jacks, uh, also two headphone jacks here. So for earbuds, if you want to, yeah, want to do that, yeah. So, uh, talk about price. Some of the applications. You have any questions about some of the things I saw? So, you know, uh, Figment XR was really neat, uh, um, and that's a multi-platform mixed reality application. It has Tilt Brush open source in in, in it. Um, yeah, you can import models. You can search for search for gifts. You can create portals, import physics, anything that Unity has. Uh, so it's a really fun sandbox uh, and natural in with the pass through. So again, like all these demos, I was just talking to developers standing next to me while they were looking at their phone, casting what I was seeing. The cast on the phone does not pass the video through for privacy reasons. So that's interesting. So you know, if you're casting what you see in the right. headset. So Chromecast or to a phone, it will it will be like a black background. It captures the overlay, objects. but it's a yeah. black background. Yeah, exactly. Uh, World was really surprising. W o o o r l d. It's a social mapping application, so it imports the 
map the 3D maps from Bing. And based on your internet connection, it will stream them in, you know, Google Maps style. But you you have a table, a virtual table, and you've done, you've done like Google Maps in VR, right? Yep. Really mm-hmm. cool. Like you're, you're Superman. You can fly. Here, it's like the heist movie where you and four other people are on a or looking at a hologram of a city and and that you can like all zoom in at the at the same you have a shared representation of that 3D model. Okay. And you then can use be markers. the kaiju raging around town. Like you're yeah. equal height to the skyscrapers. You That's can zoom in, you like. can scale it up and down, you can draw and point and create like holographic markers, tilt brush style uh for all sorts of like planning up, you know, fun or, or they have games built in. There's a like a street view you can like, you know, place a little marker and you're all uh put in a street view. As soon as I saw this, I was thinking like so many real estate listings now use Matterport for the virtual tours. I in, immediately like this is going to be part of real estate listings. Oh, 100 percent. Imagine like in real estate, if you you in a real estate, they don't even the same room, right? You're all avatars. They have headsets and it's telepresence. And you can like look through a map of the city and like, you know, draw out. This is where the neighborhoods are. This is where restaurants are like. Here's where a property we're looking at here and then drop into a street view and then see a 360 video of what the neighborhood looks like. Like that, that type of you know use of maps is like, it feels like a real powerful use of, uh, of maps and social. And it's, um, it's, it's, it was one of the first uh, telepresence applications where, you know, when I dropped in, you're not in a fixed location. Like you're not in a, uh, I'm standing in seat A or seat B or seat C. Like the other people, there are just in their own spaces, which may be different size spaces that we're in, I'm in, but they we all have an anchor, which is the map. And you can teleport yourself or free locomotion yourself relative to the map anywhere you want to be. But then if I look to the right and that avatar is right there, then they're looking to me at the left. And so is that like virtual avatar in your space, in a, in a shared virtual space? Yeah, that's cool. Uh, since the, the announcement, it sounds like a lot of developers have started coming out of the woodwork sharing that they've had access to Quest Pro uh, for you know the better part of a year now and started sharing some videos of the things they've been using with the pass-through, with some of the phase tracking. And one of the things that's interesting is a lot of them are also tapping into the grayscale pass-through. So supporting Quest 2 as well as Quest Pro. Why not? Having a version, exactly, yeah. right? And having a version of their game that's or a software experience that's going to allow for grayscale pass-through as the base level and then color pass-through as in just a, a slider to toggle on if the user has a Quest Pro. Uh, and that's an untapped market right now. I mean, it's, it's like it, it's been slowly coming out that games incorporate pass-throughs and they open up that, that ability for developers. But yeah this should flood the market with that. And I think that's going to be powerful as well. It, it The Quest Pro isn't more capable of doing any kind of slam uh, of actual world geometry, is it? Where it could just naturally, without any assistance, detect where f- tables are, couches, you know, in addition to walls. So not automated, gener- automatically generated. It won't do the thing that, um, what's the application on the phone that uses LIDAR, oh, what's the scanning app? It's, it's a, a photogrammetry app yeah. on the phone uh, the, where if you use your phone and it has a LIDAR, it not only can map like where the ceilings are and the rooms are, it can identify that's a, a doorway and that's a, the assumption is that's a mirror. It yeah. does have semantic understanding is what right. I should say. Right? It, it's, it's only doing the mesh for, for depth purposes. There's an app on App Lab. I forget what it's called. I'm looking for my phone. It's, it's like Dungeon Maker. Mm. And it's it's an augmented reality app for Quest Two. It, it's absolutely worth your money, and and it's fantastic. You you go into your room, you get a pass through, and then you can turn your room into a dungeon. But one of the features that it has is you can tell it where your surfaces are. So you you stretch a rectangle over the couch, and then it becomes a a. a um, what is it? it? It includes things that are behind it. So you can then put traps behind your couch that you can't actually see until you walk around, which up until recently, like until, unless you had that feature, you would, that wouldn't work. You'd see everything, even if it was, you know, behind a wall. Yeah. Um, so that, that kind of thing is what interests me a lot because this kind of experience where you can turn your own space into a playground, um, it needs to be more automatic. And like when I put my son into this app, 
he was like, well, what, you had to tell it all this stuff? <laughs> he was not impressed. And I was super impressed. But like, I, I realized that that's where it has to go. And absolutely. And like painting VR was an application I used where you could tell it that is a that is a surface so your paint tools can, the physics will work properly or that's a flat surface. And so you can drop it there, pick an object up, but it won't do it automatically. And there's no reason. That's just like over time, right? That's just right. building a database and using AI and, and the neural learnings, right? To, to, to understand different types of spaces. There is some demo that they showed of a robot walking up the wall and then onto yeah. the ceiling. So yep. on, I guess those had to be user defined, those yeah. surfaces. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and, I think there's a difference between understanding the barriers of a of room, the walls of a room, because that's just right. There, there are six planes, right? It's pl very pl very planar, uh, and something like a couch versus a desk, right? Yeah. Something to sit on versus something to be a writing surface. And you know, I have a super cluttered space. Like it's it's gonna be a far a long time before right. uh, a space like this um, can be mapped properly. With it did remind me too. of the of that Magic Leap 1 demo that was... What oh, was that yeah, called? Dr. Garbart's Invaders. Yeah. Oh, my God. I was thinking, like, Meta needs to pay Weta to port that to Quest Pro. Oh, dude, that's a great idea. I mean, the, the problem... They did so much problem solving. They did scalable portals. They would have mm -hmm. the understanding automatically of how big your walls were, and it would scale dynamically how big to open the, the portal into the other world, the type of environments it could generate, and how many monsters could come through at one time. Yeah. I mean, yeah, this, this is why it feels like it's still the very beginning, the early days of yeah. the, the AR, the MR stuff. Uh, and then the, the sneak peeks of the, the far future. So the control labs wristbands, you know, Michael Abrash talked about uh, the test they can do now where not only is it the subtle micro gestures in your hands to, as input, but adapting and using AI so that over time, everyone's micro gestures will be different. And so uh, that's an important part. It's not, it's not a unified button press to, to relate a certain action. It's going to have to be constantly training based on how the user who wears this wristband uses it. But their goal is that it'll be better than using a keyboard and mouse. Because it is, it, because it will be. The physics is actually better than using a keyboard or mouse because it like can it senses that movement before your digit actually moves. So it has the advantage of speed of light, <laughs> speed of neurons, right? Speed of neurons. It, it goes back it's to speed of in in uh, <laughs> Norton because <laughs> shores do. <laughs> it, it's it's like uh every i'm going to tie it to pop culture every time there's a superman versus green lantern you know battle in some type of story it's like superman can move faster than green lantern can send neurons to the ring so to let it know what to do yeah well i, I, I don't know i don't know i don't know how fast it's gonna be the accuracy is gonna be more important i think than, than latency true uh, but then, like if it's that if it's that fast it'll mimic you your feeling is that it'll mimic the action that you told your digit to take <laughs> yeah, on the what, same what, time what, scale because right now everything has a latency to it right 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 sometimes the latency is good sometimes taking a moment the, the latency between my brain thinking something and my brain saying that's what i should type on the keyboard Nah, man, you press it's the key. Good. You press the key <laughs> no, with your mind. It's yeah. too late. <laughs> unfiltered, unfiltered thoughts. Uh, and, and speaking of that, uh, the Ready Player One analogy. Remember in, in Ready Player One where Wade gets the offer from Sorrento about you know, how much money he'd give him to give up the key? Yes. And he had to turn on his, his reaction filter. Uh, that's a thing that's in the UI. I mean, the, the privacy features will be on by default, where face tracking, eye tracking will not be on unless you turn them on. Uh, and they can be toggled, uh, either of those, anytime in the, in the shortcut menu. So if you're, if you're in a game of, uh, of, of high-stakes negotiations in, in, <laughs> in Horizon workrooms and you, and you don't want to give away <laughs> your, your, uh, your hand, then you got to turn off the face tracking and turn off the eye tracking and, and hide those micro – or slider – you know, adjust them with the slider in the future. Yeah. Uh, and then full body uh, codec, codec avatars. Uh, they, they allowed some people, uh, some journalists who went up to, to Redmond. So Reality Labs Research, Michael Abrash showed them uh, their full telepresence demo. And this is the photorealistic tracked real-time uh, avatars that are, you know, AI optimized. 
this is legit. And I think they showed some of this at SIGGRAPH this year. So this was using a phone, taking a few kind of quick shots, it mapping your entire face and body, and you have to do a few gestures and, and facial expressions, and then generating a full codec that was like that is like the painting that follows you around uh in the sense that your eye movement is is reflected your your uh mouth movements are reflected in this avatar like it, this was the most amazing technology they displayed all week with real time lighting so the the 2.0 mm-hmm. versions are even more realistic uh more subtle animations uh and then they also had a faster rendered one where someone could use a camera phone at home in good lighting show some expressions and then with ai they would over a couple hours compute and generate a a a still usable photorealistic codec avatar that was better than looking than you know what you'd find in a video game today Speaking of video games, they did announce a few video games coming to the mm-hmm. Quest line, including Iron Man VR, which you'll remember from PlayStation VR two years ago. Uh, was it just two years ago? 2019. Longer. Yeah, three years ago. Um, I actually only played the demo of that game, and now I'm glad I did because now I get to experience it tetherless. Um, but people generally liked that game, but as every game on PlayStation VR that used the controllers were, it was seriously hampered by the tracking. So... Um, should be a better experience here. I'll be curious to see how it plays. Uh, they also announced Population One getting a sandbox mode, user generated comp maps. Yeah, finally, yeah, I, big deal. I haven't been in that game in a while, but that's one of the great gems of the Quest line. I'm I'm so excited to see how that goes. Among Us VR, any any takers here? You guys excited for that? Uh, Not really. Yeah, it's, it's Chanel games, and they always do good stuff. And they also did announce a uh, uh, I expect you to die Home Edition. For so, free, yeah, yeah, and it's a uh, it will be used pass through VR and turn your home into an escape room. That's what I'm saying. That, I, I'm that game's that. underrated. Underrated. Everyone loves that game. No, no, no. Like Among Us is overrated. <laughs> yes, uh, I expect you to die is underrated. Um, the the second one made a lot of money. Had a, had a great opening intro. Uh, yeah, you know Bond style. You're you're in the Bond opening credits, basically. The Walking Dead's getting a follow up. People love that that Saints and Sinners game. Yeah, uh, it's a great t- game. Um, I I and I don't have the zombie fetish that most of the internet has, so I I did not play very much of it, but it looked great. Like I could tell it was a solid game. Are you gonna play the sequel? Yeah, it, it's super tense. It's what it, it, the mechanic of having that time, how limited time that you could be in the maps before the zombie horde would come right made those really really tense and a lot of that has a do with like the you know, dual-handed physics they were like let's let people, let people have bone lab style you know uh, physics chopping off heads uh but limited ammo is a survival game and it's in that walking dead world yeah i love that and the final announcement was behemoth an unknown survival game by the same team who brought you um Saints and Sinners. Yeah, uh, that's um, Skydance, Skydance Interactive. Right. And they've done good stuff. Yep, yep. Uh, so that's that's the big stuff out of MetaConnect. Uh, there was the whole Carmack talk, which he did as an avatar without face tracking. He didn't want to have the face tracking in that, interestingly. I, either he didn't want it or he was told not to. Now, number mm. one, like I, had, I wondered, was it the battery life? Because the guy's going to talk. And maybe it's not going to last that long. But he said... You know, it'll probably do something janky and people start be commenting on it and we don't want that to become the headline. So that was, yeah, I, I was really sad to see that. I wanted to see an example of that tech live and in action. Yeah. It was unfortunate. But I understand well, them w- needing it to be perfect before they dis- display it just in the information environment they're in. But they I would have, wa- I want, I wanted to see an imperfect version. Even if got, it got a little janky, it would have been great. They have two weeks <laughs> to get it perfect. You know, they don't have a whole lot of time here. It, it should be pretty good by now. If they want it to be perfect, maybe they just cheated and, and used some extra sensors. I'm talking about the feet jumping. Oh, yeah. that became the headline. Yeah, Upload VR found out that the demo of tracked feet was actually using external sensors and not the the AI based tracked feet. Uh, 
technology that, that was teased, I think, uh, even before before Connect. That's the 2022 version of like those guys that jumped out of the plane ab- and like aimed the Wi-Fi so that the uh, iPhone had reception as it came in. To <laughs> <laughs> don't you remember that that um, keynote where like they did the the skydive and that was they... Google Glass, right? Google oh, Glass. Google Glass. That's what they I was jumped saying. out skydiving Google Glass. Yes. Onto Moscow and they had the Center. Wi-Fi people, so they kept signal all the way oh down. God. Yeah, that was wow. the 2022 version of that moment. What hubris that we saw would never come again. Uh, okay, well, yeah, uh, a lot of forward-looking technologies. Um, I'm really curious about just like what developers do with pass-through and how they embrace it. Like, regardless of how clear it is, full uh, going from grayscale scale to color in a mass market way is a big deal. Yes, we've had pass through in Vive Pro. Yes, we've had face tracking, eye tracking in Vive Pro. But those are so specialized, high price plus aftermarket accessories. Here is a standardized thing. The investment they've put into the avatar systems, whether people adopt that, the investment they've put into Horizon workrooms. Like, will people want to have these virtual monitors, you know, in in, in web browse with a headset in their kitchen? We don't know. Yep. We don't know. I'll, we'll be putting them into the test. Uh, last thoughts, last words. Uh, I was, you know, I just read off all the gaming announcements. I'm a little disappointed, to be honest with you. I, I was expecting a Grand Theft Auto update. I was expecting some big games announced. Like, as you said, Sanzaro has been under their wing for a long time. And uh, I kind of am I'm excited for the next big thing on the quest. Um, yeah. You know, if it's Quest Pro or not, it doesn't matter. It's the same processor, so it can run on everything. And I wanted to see some big news. And this year was all about office work and productivity. And I think that they are running a risk more than you do with PlayStation 2 VR, PlayStation VR 2, PSVR 2 coming out right around the corner. I think that that will be announced before the next Connect, maybe even for sale. And that's oh, yeah. that's going to be a big, big contender. I want that to be success. I want PSVR 2 to be successful. I want the developers there to make money. And then when the Quest 3 comes out, I want them to port their games to Quest 3 because I want VR developers to make as much money as possible. The more money that VR developers make across all the platforms, the more yeah. content we're going to see. Well, that's true. Well, we, we can talk about it in two weeks in Microsoft Teams. <laughs> <laughs> How's that? Oh my gosh, that's another big thing. Yes, Accenture and Surprise, Microsoft Teams and 365 using meta avatars, again, just using what's already been built. Uh, and on that, Facebook doesn't have, or meta doesn't have to develop uh, office productivity suites because they can just use Word and remote windows and, and Azure in headset. I, like, we're not going <laughs> to talk about this. I was surprised that Satya Nadella was there. I was like, I was pretty caught off guard ab- about that. And I think that was... It wasn't much of a big deal for Microsoft. I think it was a big deal for Meta that he was there. Well, I I think that it's an alliance that makes sense. It's an alliance that they hope will get them ahead of Apple. It's Mm -hmm. an alliance that tells you Microsoft is perhaps less interested in developing their own VR hardware. And if Lord, that was the death nail of HoloLens, (laughs) if there hasn't been enough. Well, at the very least, uh, the, uh, uh, the VR side, you know, yeah. and, and, and the rumors even of HP leaving the VR market in the next year. Um, yeah, that's why not um, just default to something else that probably won't be Apple. Um, and it, it didn't interfere with the Connect or the uh, Surface event that happened the day after. You know, that was all about what Microsoft kind of really cares about, which is selling Windows and selling hard, decent looking hardware uh, that all runs, you know, Windows 11. Um, all right, we've done enough about MetaConnect. Uh, I do have one segment I want to talk about. Let's do some quick pop culture. Oh my goodness. I just looked at the time. It's like the good old days. We are over an hour into the podcast and we've only got now to pop culture. Uh, Only really one thing I want to talk about. It's Ricard season three, the second trailer. 
I assume you out there who are listening have watched it. If you haven't, skip for, let's say, five minutes because I will talk about the revelations in this trailer. But more importantly, I don't haven't talked to you guys since the trailer dropped. What was your big reaction when they showed that character? You know what I'm talking about, Jeremy. I don't know if I know what you're talking about, man. Have you not seen the trailer? Uh, I thought I saw the trailer. <laughs> you, so... You, I just remember the moment. I remember where I was. I was in college watching that episode where Picard turns as Data comes out and he goes, lore, and just being like, oh, holy shit. And then Jordy got to do that this time around. And I thought that was the delivery was the same as when Picard did that in that episode all those years ago. And I lo- I loved it. Um, I also, it, it was endearing seeing all of them together. Yeah. Yeah. The, the warm, fuzzy feelings. This, this is what I wanted. I think what we all wanted when they announced Picard as a series. And I'm surprised that we're getting a third season, you know, three seasons of Patrick Stewart back. I don't think we, any of us anticipated that, but I think they're, <laughs> I'm crossing fingers. There's one, a new enterprise that's glimpsed. It's the enterprise that's based off of a design odyssey class i want to say from star trek online so star trek online designed and made canon as the enterprise f hopefully we'll find out what happened to enterprise e there's a second titan in this that's the ship that you see uh, seven of nine on uh lore yes that's i think probably the biggest name in terms of uh, a, a legacy character coming back it's also how brent spiner is going to be in the show we assume he is going to be an antagonist of sorts, or he's not, maybe not the primary antagonist because we saw the the woman played by um, uh, what's her name, uh, Amanda Plummer, I want to say, uh, as as a villain. Unknown what her motives are, or or you know what what her deal is, but it's not Laura I'm talking about. Sure, <laughs> it's Moriarty. Yeah, I know it's Moriarty. I was having fun with the lore reveal. Moriarty, is that somebody from DS9? What? Oh, <laughs> give me a break. Are, are, are you what Josh? Are we <laughs> doing here? Is that the doctor from Voyager? Oh my goodness. You've strayed so far. <laughs> so far from the path, Jeremy. He hasn't been off the podcast this long to forget my, all that we talked about. Is it a Marvel about. character? No. Uh, <laughs> are you being serious? Um... Not about the last question, <laughs> no, <laughs> but the first two uh, was okay. J- possible. Jeremy, is this the guy with the top hat? Yes. Who is he from? Professor Moriarty from the holodeck, Data's nemesis in the Sherlock Holmes episode. Oh wow, that's cool. Yeah, and the one of the best episodes of Next Generation is when he gains sentience. Well, he gains sentience in the first episode, but he comes back. And he traps Picard. In the holodeck. Yeah. And the last we saw him, he was living out his life on a memory cube on Picard's desk on Whoa. Enterprise D. Wow. Gave That's him a cool. lifetime of adventures. A lifetime of power. Right. Yeah, that just ring a bell. I did see that episode and I remember liking it. But these things just like, <laughs> I don't think about them for much after the day. <laughs> Wow. That's the difference between you and me, Jeremy. Yeah. I do nothing but think about <laughs> these after the day. That's Danica's all I do. Like, Danica's That's all like, I do. he only talks to me about <laughs> Professor Moriarty. What happened to Professor Moriarty? The That's thought experiments. Great. It was the most Black Mirror of all the episodes. It's Black Mirror before Black Mirror about virtual lives and AI and simulations. I can say definitively Moriarty has no role in the Star Trek Next Generation pinball machine. <laughs> So there, that's one reason why I have no idea what you're okay. talking about. All right. Well, he was, no one expected him to be back. He's back, uh, presumably still a hologram, maybe with a mobile emitter now in the 25th century or late 24th century, I forget where they are now in the timeline. Uh, but uh, the hits, they're bringing back the hits. Yeah. I, I have, hope more and more surprises. The fan service, this is fan service I can get behind. It's coming out next year on Paramount Plus. Uh, the final season of Picard. Everyone looks great. The ships look great. What they showed, it looks it looks perilous, uh, and I hope that they uh, they conclude it well. Do you? Yeah. Do you think they will conclude it with uh, something that keeps Picard from ever possibly coming back for a fourth season? Yes, 
Mm. I think he's done. I think Patrick Stewart's done. Okay. I, I think there, there's going to be different torchbearers, uh, even setting up Seven of Nine being in the show. I think she's a torchbearer now of Star Trek. Uh, so I think there's opportunity for spinoffs, but I think Patrick Stewart done, is done after this. And there, there are rumors and, you know, in, in the press interviews at New York Comic Con, they were saying, uh, would they do another season? Would they do another movie? Uh, they're not going to do another movie. I right. think, you know, at some point that Paramount Plus money is going to run out <laughs> right? and, and they're spending it on Strange New Worlds. Like the future of Trek is in Strange New Worlds and Discovery uh, and some of the animated stuff and younger audience uh, as well uh, with Prodigy. And I think, Patrick Stewart has served his time. He can retire. He can retire. Go, go make, make more, make more wine, read more poetry. Um, all right. That's the pop culture moment. Uh, oh yeah. And, and, and you know what? We did one thing in pop culture. I think we'd be remiss if we did not do also. time for a moment of science uh this story comes submitted from a user uh jareware i think is his handle uh there is a there is a paper that came out in the journal neuron uh from this um uh, startup in the uk called cortical labs and uh, what Cortical Labs is trying to do is something that uh, a lot of neuroscience researchers have been trying to do which is take uh, a series of of uh, what's called human induced pluripotent cells, grow them into uh, neuronal cells. So you can actually uh, this what I'm about to describe actually won a Nobel Prize. You can take skin cells, actually have them undergo a process, have them turn back into stem cells, and then from those stem cells you can regrow them into other mature types of cells. So in this case, you basically take probably skin cells turn them back into stem cells and then regrow them into neurons. Uh, and if you grow these neurons in like a media where they, they're essentially surrounded with food and you grow them and grow them, and grow them, you can get enough neurons that you can start to essentially see some dendrites and axons, which are like the connections between neurons form. Uh, and if you set up a system that can actually continually put um, electrical pulses into this, uh, those uh, neurons will start acting like a system and perform some behaviors. So uh, a group in the UK essentially built a chip. Uh, this uh, It was a multi-electrode array that essentially kept pulsing this Petri dish full of these neurons. It probably had about 800,000 cells in it um, uh, with uh, electrical signals. Um, and uh, connected it to a sensor, uh, a sensory array that would feed it uh, inputs. And uh, so this uh, set of cells had uh, had food and it had stimuli, and now it had a input. Uh, and the input they decided was a simulated version of the game Pong. And what they did is they created uh, a simulated paddle and a simulated ball and by pulsing uh, electrical signals into these neurons, you created a system where um, the neurons could, quote unquote, learn uh, and uh, play Pong. And um, they tested out a number of scenarios and was to, able to demonstrate that the neuron, the electrical signals that the neurons in this dish generated were uh, were more significant when it was able to essentially keep playing the ball. It like had a different stimuli if they missed and uh, one if the paddle actually connected with the ball. Um, I don't want you to think about this as if neurons in a dish were playing the game Pong. That is not what happened. I, uh, I think you're being really inconsiderate here, Kishore. <laughs> These so-called neurons in a dish have a name, okay? <laughs> you want me to call them dish brain? I, I think that you could call it by its name, Dish Brain. Yes, I do. Dish Brain is the uh, marketing name that this company, <laughs> Cortical Labs, has come up with for this essentially neuron on a chip. Um, and they're trying to explore essentially like a Terminator 
design of mixing organic and electrical arrays to see if they can uh, generate more uh, complicated uh, like systems of, of stimuli and response. Uh, so it actually did demonstrate that this, uh, th- that this system was able to quote unquote learn and like, um, and there is indications that when it was able to make contact with the simulated paddle, uh, and the ball that it was able to sort of keep that going more than a control set of cells that were non neurons in the, um, uh, I don't think to do. it is the preferred pronoun. I, <laughs> I think it, let's go with they, them until we know any better. Okay. Fair. Uh, this is incredibly, this is an enclosed system. It is a set of cells, a, a pretty simple electrode array, um, and a constant, uh, stimuli. The funny thing is, is what they're going to try to do next is essentially dose the cells with some alcohol to see how it would function playing pong a little inebriated. <laughs> this is wow. great. This is great, wow. man. I, I uh, got to tell you, though, I've played a lot of pong over the past year d- working on Atari 50th. As you <laughs> as you know, it's, it's the 50th year of introducing pong. That's where they marked the beginning. And uh, I'm 90% sure Dishbrain could beat me. <laughs> it is not younger. So. It's younger, right? Oh Fresh my gosh. neurons. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you're functioning with a capacity of 800,000 neurons, I'd be very concerned about you, my friend. <laughs> sounds like a lot. I, I, I'm sorry. I'd be very concerned about they. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta get it right. All right. Uh, that wraps it for a moment of science. And that also wraps it basically for this episode. So as we alluded to at the beginning of the show, we got some stuff to announce. Um, and unbeknownst to you, dear listener, as you've been listening to this episode, uh, what you've been listening to hasn't just been uh, a reunion of getting Jeremy on the show here and our big annual recap, uh, which we've been doing for four or five years now of the big VR, biggest VR event uh, of the year. Uh, but this listener is actually our final episode of This Is Only a Test, the podcast. Uh, yes, it's true. We're, we're, not, we're not joking. This is not a joke. Uh, it's, it's, it's a serious, real thing. Uh, we were after 668 episodes Maybe a little more, maybe a little less. The yeah, count is not the most accurate right. in the world. It is. It's not. Uh, October cast included, CES recordings included, and 12 years of doing the show. Uh, we are retiring the podcast. Um, and there no no grand reason for it. Uh, we've been doing it for so long. The, 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 the Our lineups change. Uh, Jeremy, you know, I don't think it's any secret that, you know, once you left the show, things were very different. Uh, but we've been, we couldn't be happier with, you know, <laughs> with what you've been able to do with that extra time. Yeah, so me, far. me too. I'm, I'm right with you on that. <laughs> um, but also, you know, where we are in our lives is different. Where Tested is, is different. Uh, and uh, we decided to use the energies of doing the show every week as we're doing it late at night even um, and refocusing them uh, elsewhere on the channel. Um, nothing major is changing in the channel. You know, uh, we'll have more stuff to talk about, uh, but this is one of the one of the things that's happening. Um, so yeah, we wanted to take this time and, you know, I don't know how long this episode's going to last. It may never end, guys. If I keep, <laughs> if I just keep this going, yeah. then the podcast, what will podcast will never die. Right? Yeah. <laughs> You'll see us come in every day. That's right. You guys can email. sign off. You know, how long can a Zoom call last? How long will Zencaster let us record record the episode? I guess, although if it doesn't end, I'll never we'll never be able to release it. And 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 that too. Then it wouldn't Is it even a podcast no if no one listens to it? That's I don't right. know. I mean we're we testing the boundaries of that, of that <laughs> right thought now. experiment right now. <laughs> you know, dozens of you, literally dozens. Uh, but we did. We're so glad, Jeremy, that timing worked out that you were able to join us for this final episode. I'm honored. Um, Jeremy, I mean, I'll be honest, you know, Will and I started this podcast and we started tested uh, in 2010, 
right? It's before we started working with Adam. 12 years ago. 12 years ago. We had podcasted together before, uh, but Jeremy, it was you. You are the first person that I podcasted with. And had you done... Po- Not for tested. Pod- you mean no, for no, no. PC Gamer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The first podcast I was on was the first episode of the PC Gamer podcast back on August 29th. 2005. So for 17 wow. years and going now, over 17 years, almost every week with occasional lapses, uh, uh, I've been in some podcast feed or another. And next week, that won't be the case. So you were there, Jeremy, when I entered this world, and you are here <laughs> when I'm leaving it. Uh, what, what an wow. elegant way to say this. I learned this by watching you. An incredible <laughs> callback. Well, the pupil has clearly become the master here. Uh, this this podcast, as you said, has been 12 years running and has garnered quite an audience that I'm sure are all now going through a little bit of a shock. Um, yeah, yeah, and, st- and understandably, and and you know, we've we've the thing that I think I told Kishore after Silicon and after every event we go to is we are always surprised that one people listen because I think. Yes, we put out the podcast and we know people listen to it. We see you know, the reviews on the, the, the video on, on YouTube and, and comments and people ping us. But so much of what we do on the podcast, we've done, at least I've done, for me as an excuse to hang out with you you guys. And especially in the past you know, three years right. where we haven't been able to see each other uh, in person. And even before then, you know, Jeremy, it was really nice to have you come in once a week. Sure. You as well. Um, and when, when, you know, even though you guys weren't, you know, full-time testing employees, just to come in for an hour, have lunch and, and shoot the shit for two plus hours. And it was the same back then with when Will and I were doing it. And you know, it was why Gary wanted to do the podcast because he got him out of the house. He, he got him out of the house. He had things to say and we had people to listen to it who wanted to hear it and we wanted to hear it. Um, and, and I think that's what makes for some of the best podcasts I, I love listen, personally love listening to is that it feels like I get a chance to hang out with people who don't know me, but I feel like I know them. And every time we do an event and people come up and say they listen to the podcast and now for the over 12 years, we've traveled the world and met listeners all around the world in the most surprising of places. And it may not be the most listened to podcasts, uh, but there are people out there and they are kindred spirits and we are so thankful. Um, and I'm so thankful for the listenership over the years. Yeah. Who've you're being, our lives, sli- yeah. you're being slightly modest with the, you know, doesn't have the most listeners. It may not be, you know, may not have the most listeners, but you have a decent number of listeners. Anyone who sees your YouTube counts knows this. Plus, most of your listeners are on audio anyway. Um, but when you mentioned uh, the PC Gamer podcast, like the reason why I wanted to do that podcast and I pitched it to PC Gamer was because when I left the magazine, I started missing having those conversations. And I realized that people, gamers, just out in the world don't always have the opportunity to have fun, interesting, funny, intelligent conversations with people like we worked with there. And this podcast absolutely carries that torch of, you know, just having really fun conversations with intelligent people. And I think this, that's probably why you have such good numbers is people enjoy hearing the, the conversations that are had on this podcast. God knows, I mean, a two-hour podcast, I never would have thought would have the sustainability, but you did it. I remember two, just two stories to illustrate the reach. I remember uh, doing this podcast, uh, Norm, with you and Joey on a patio next to CERN one morning. Like, we woke up early one morning and recorded this podcast, like looking out towards the French Alps and uh, like next to one of the grandest devices humanity has ever created um, and talked about stupid pop culture and technology stories. And it was great. Um, And once I was in India with my family uh, and we're staying at a hotel near the Taj Mahal And I have like my bags and I'm about to get into an elevator with my mom and the elevator opens and this guy goes Kishore from the tested podcast. 
and my mom does this like slow turn <laughs> to look at me as that statement comes out of her mouth. And it, a, you know, those are just kind of some funny moments, but I remember meeting listeners at the live show at just on the street in airports. I've met um, a number of people. They're always so incredibly nice and thoughtful. And I would always do the same shtick. I would apologize. I'm like, I'm so sorry. You yeah. listen to our podcast. And, um, Me and, <laughs> and I still do that. Uh, but I, what I did that just as like a reflex because I did this for me. Like I've been on this show only six years. Uh, my first show, by the way, Embrace the Splurge was the title of that show because of my Black Friday habit. Um, and I was on with Sean and Norm. Uh, and I just remember being like, oh, this is great. I get to just talk with my friends for a couple hours. And little did I know how that statement was the understatement of the century because like I did this podcast every week, so I'd have time to talk with my friends, Jeremy and Norm. And like our whole relationship like bloomed because of that. Norm had two kids. Like we had life changes. They're all happening. Those lunches were the best. And like, um, like all this like weird, incredible, challenging, fun, thrilling life moments happened all surrounding us doing this like weekly thing. Uh, and I'm totally sad right now seeing that go it's also it's time but at the same time like i am filled with all of these memories not just of the listeners but primarily of the of the two of you and the silly stuff that we would talk about for a couple hours a week um it was really the the whole point of the podcast to me was about growing those friendships in a real way and they're going to continue in the in the real world following but um it was awesome and it was an incredible ride and there's no two people I would rather be here with on the last show than, than the two of you. Yeah, absolutely. I want to go over, you know, we, we started the podcast and we started the channel and the website as a technology channel. And one of the things that has been a through thread, even though we've shifted to covering lots of different topics now, obviously uh, being so uh, maker centric and the community that Adam has brought along and the community that we've embraced and has embraced us, um, honestly, and being a, a YouTube channel. Uh, one of the through threads is that this has always been a, a place that we've been able to geek out about you know, a lot of things that we are interested in, other makers are interested in, which is the, the emerging technologies and having fun as we just did for the past hour and a half, dissecting, you know, what the future can look like and technology and the products, even though so much of it is consumer product based, what they, what those products, what those technologies tell about the, the, the process of design, the process of engineering, the process of problem solving and the process of creativity. And one of the, the mandates that, we got, you know, to be able to do the podcast, even after we started being so much maker focused, was to think about how technology allows for people to have a point of view and that what new phones allow for, you know, for people to, 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 to tell stories through photos and video and be creative and what, uh, what 3D, you know, not just like 3D printers and, and, and drones, but, you know, even the most mundane of technologies and even things like VR, how do these enable new types of creativity and storytelling that is all shared in uh, the maker culture? Um, and that was a nice place for us to, to occupy in, in covering those things. So I do have a list of some of the technology that did not exist or were not in the mainstream that we had talked about that and we had kind of discovered along with consumers as they emerged back in 2010. And I want to go over and, and set some quick thoughts from both of you uh, about, you know, have these matured? Are they still interesting? Did they reach their potential? And we'll start off with like 2010 when we started the podcast was when the iPad came out. Tablets were not a thing. Smartphone was out. Windows CE, Palm, I iPhone OS in 2007, but the iPad came out and I'd say it made it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Apple. Who would have thought? <laughs> yeah. I can go dig out my Nexus seven if I really have to, but yeah, I think the iPad pro that's sitting here next to me is like, I think shows where it is. It's become an everyday device for me. Uh, and I don't think I would have said that, two, three years ago, even. 
Um, so the iteration from like, oh, this is just a larger flow phone to its own device ecosystem, its own use case uh, has been wonderful. It's like, it's just like ubiquitous now. It's just like, like, I, I can't imagine not having a tablet around. When it comes to the next generation, I don't know if you guys have kids that use an iPad exclusively. My daughter uses an iPad exclusively. Now, it's not that her whole generation, because like her older brother's on the, on the PC 24-7, but she is on the iPad. I gave her, I handed down my MacBook Pro this past year to her because she needed a computer, I assumed. What's it a has, computer? It has sat on the shelf ever since I gave it to her. It's iPad and iPad only, and it's five finger gestures and swiping, and like this, it's almost like this mental connection she has with the device, where she wills it to do her what her bidding, and she's so fast with everything that it can do. She uses Procreate and these creative apps to do stop motion animation and video editing, and it's an insane. So like it, it clearly has one, and be, beyond my use cases, which is you know my nighttime reading it's like for the next generation they they get it yeah and and more so than the phone the smartphone uh and i think a lot of when the, the ipad and tablets first came out we used and with the android tablets as well we thought of the the star trek pad was our uh was our guiding star for how we thought people would use it as oh it's like a it's like a magazine it's like a book right uh but more so than never it is a more of a creation a device for creation i think more so than even the smartphone so yes tablets you made it uh 3d printing and maybe like cnc in general 3d printing laser cutting and and machining those devices were really emerging jeremy we've told this story before but i remember when will and i were back at maximum pc and you were doing stuff with playstation core and you walked by our our, our cubicles and said guys you want to get in on a you want to get in on a 3d printer <laughs> We could each chip in a couple hundred bucks, and we could make a thing that makes things. Wow. Was it the cupcake the cupcakes, one? It was the cupcake CNC, and like ah uh, maybe. And then when Will and I left to start testing, one of our first videos was making and building the cupcake CNC. So obviously, three D printers had they, they they went through the entire the entire cycle of the promise and the trough of due solution men and a glorious return um and i think now it's it really has feel like it's matured and it has reached more people in more places than ever with the right ecosystems to support it yeah it's, it's kind of stabilized uh, i uh-oh uh-oh we lost something um it's it's the kind of technology that i feel like a little bit like vr is at right now where where or at least you know quest and it's on a we're not there with VR, so I probably shouldn't make that comparison, but it's how I feel at the moment because I want more. Uh, but but 3D printing be was really, really hard at the beginning. You had to, it was a major hobby to like get the thing running, keep it running, fix your prints, tweak your settings. And nowadays, if you get a decent printer, it's reliable, it's consistent. I mean, I, I've had my MK, my Prusa MK3 for years Things a workhorse. It's perfect print every time, and so yeah. As long as you know what you're doing to begin with, it's certainly stabilized. But I look forward to newer technologies that don't require supports like you know laser sintering and that become coming online. I feel like we are still in these kind of strange early days with 3D printing, even though it's stabilized. Well, I, I think we're also in a uh, uptick of the, uh, resin printing that has had renewed so much interest in in three D printing. Do you system. think that that's that that will ever reach the you know as far as fused filament has? I, 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 I think it's surpassed it, surpassed FTM. Really, I think yeah. there's still a lot to do on processing, um, meaning like just the whole IPA use and like the curing, and uh, that's still quite an entry point for a lot of people. And I think that's going to become more of a, a one step, like within the machine, there's going to be systems to handle that, uh, in the future. Uh, so the fact that it's still like a two step process right now, the key is I'm waiting for the machine that like sands your print after yeah. you're done with it. Like <laughs> right. that'll be the thing that changes everything. Yeah. yeah. I remember, I think it was about six year, years ago when Norm, we went to, 
to carbon 3d and we're looking at resin printers and now there's like there's like a hundred fifty dollar one sitting off to the side of my camera here uh it's just remarkable seeing some of that technology go from only the most advanced startups have something like this to now it's just everywhere and and be accepted that these are they can be commodity products that they can be hundred and there's enough dollars and there's enough of a community that I don't have to spend all day in like in Fusion 360 yeah. designing my own stuff. Like I, there's enough enough files and enough uh, ecosystem out there for me to just pick up some stuff and print. I say the future is still probably unwritten yet because it feels early in the, in, in the way that we are. Uh, but there was a point where at Maker Fairs, the 3D printing pavilion had become so stale or had just really diminished and all the investment had gone away. Uh, and I think we're, even though Maker Fair didn't necessarily survive, uh, 3D printing as a community, I think is thriving right now. Um, drones, another big tech, drones and uh, an and, and RC in the sky, aviation uh, exploding really also around 2012. When uh, when DJI released the Phantom and the Phantom Two, and also went similarly through a, 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 a ubiquity and then a stabilization, yeah, and and now the technology is more advanced than ever, uh, but certainly not as ubiquitous as well, we thought it'd be. It found an audience. Like initially, it was like, who wants these? Is it RC plane flyers? You know, is it like just is it? hobbyists who just want to have something to fly around it turned out that it was photographers and and people who want to shoot video and a few people who want to race <laughs> a lot of few people who want to race it yeah. really became the racers the thrill seekers yeah. that are, are pushing the boundaries right now and you saw that with the new dji drone that they just put out it's it's uh, it's all and, and those racers are the ones who are doing the the most amazing cinematography that is where the overlap is um uh, and the tech is still amazing, uh, and it's gotten smaller. It's a case where the, the smaller stuff is the better stuff, really, uh, and it's found its place in the, the enterprise space as well, and, and or the, the business space as well, uh, with more and more like Hollywood films. You know, from uh, what was that? Uh, the big uh, Ryan Reynolds Rock movie have a oh, the, the uh, ambulance, the Michael Bay movie, he's heavily using. Uh, drone racing, uh, drone racers to fly uh, cinematogra- cinematographically, uh, and then what was that big uh, Rus- uh, Russo brothers film, uh, Gray Man? Also, a lot of drone photography. I, I will say, of all the bleeding edge hardware that I purchased after we talked about it on the show, this is the one that's probably started to gather the most dust for mm. me. Mm. I don't. I just Same. don't use mine. Yeah, mine's been in the box for years, actually. my I don't even remember what model it was. But uh, yeah, I loved it while I flew it, but that was it. And it's one where it was a Wild West regulation. And because of how dangerous it could be, because of privacy concerns, uh, they're still solving that right now. You know, uh, the, uh, the the ID stuff, remote ID stuff for uh, for drones just went into effect for manufacturers last month. Hasn't really been resolved. And manufacturers are still kind of scrambling to figure out how to meet those regulations, FAA regulations in the States, uh, and and what consumers have to do with their drones that they've already bought or new drones coming out next year. So uncertain future as well in the consumer space. I also want to give a shout out to, to Skydio and their uh, autonomy and being the, some of the coolest technology we've ever seen on that, tested and able to dissect. Uh, they're, that they're was a podcast here. lunch where we came in and watched you fly Skydio around us. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and and that in the wide open, you know, the the video where we took the Boston Dynamics robot out and Adam <laughs> and tracking the Boston Dynamics robot with a Skydio drone autonomously, or tracking Adam when he was on his one wheel, right? That is footage that's incredible. The Absolutely. automated um, cable camera stuff. Yeah, we've I think feel like we've only scratched the surface of autonomous drones. Don't so they have a like, new one? I saw them in my news feed recently. Software. At least, oh, okay. I don't know about the uh, the two is still I think the most recent one. Yeah, okay. Uh, VR, you want to get? I mean, we just did a whole episode on VR, but early days, I think it's maybe. <laughs> I, I, I mean, honestly, my my the thing I was saying about it, the industry having to reboot, is like a big realization I, I had recently, and that so to me that's where we're at. We are that's why we're in these frustratingly long early days. I I do feel like we are still 
quite quite early in terms of where this is going. And I hope that Facebook has the patience for it and the consumers do too. Hardware is hard. Anytime you're trying to solve a physics problem with engineering, it's going to probably take longer than you think. And that's why some of the, the software improvements have skyrocketed or software innovations have where it's not reliant on manufacturing, especially with chip shortages and, and the like. Um, and things like per, personal assistance were also a tech oh, that it's notable. Hang, hang on one second. Hey, Jibo, <laughs> set my alarm for. <laughs> I, I it's think not responding for some reason. We still have the Jibo at the office. I, uh, when was the Amazon Echo introduced? Oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. After Siri, right? Had to have been. Yeah. So after iPhone 4, uh, what was the first? Uh, I will dig this up. November 6, 2014. Oh, my gosh. 2014. That's only seven years ago. That's wild. That's unbelievable because to me, that feels like something that is indispensable to me at this point. I, it's I remember it. you bringing that in, Jeremy, as your favorite thing of the year. And I was just like, really? The black <laughs> obelisk? You're bringing it in? And, just like, and then I was wrong. It was, it's been so omnipresent in my life. Yeah, it's in every room here. It's We've really just welcomed Big Brother into our world. Well, speaking of that, I think that's emblematic of the ubiquity of the smart devices. And remember 10 years ago, we were talking about smart things and attachments to things. And, and now it's so cheap and, and voice activated everything. Uh, and uh, automation is just, it, it's, if there are they are commodity products now, and businesses are trying to figure out how to make money on them with services to supplement it because they can't make money on on the hardware. Um, and combined with you know the drones and the robots and and all that stuff, but yes, I think we could say personal assistants and smart devices made it. They made it. They are everywhere. Uh, something that really started that we'd expect to change the world was the sharing economy as a technology. Applications. This is born out of of everyone having a smartphone and an internet connection, but the apps of Uber and Airbnb and and uh, delivery services and and TaskRabbit also have just fundamentally changed the world and our lives uh, faster than we could have imagined. I'm not Are you sure in- for the better. Right. I'm still mad that one day. During the podcast, we weren't able to order a flu vaccine on Uber. That was like they were doing that in select cities. And I so wanted to do that live on the air. That that makes me think of crowdfunding. Is that on your list or it's are you not on the list? But that needs to be point. Kickstarter started around 2010. Yeah. Yeah, no, I remember like my Kickstarter was 2013 and I felt like I was late. <laughs> you know, I'm, uh, like, and and no. we were, I, I remember doing the math like, can this be a business? Is this a right. $100 million business? And like, if they're taking a small cut of, you know, these things, how much, how many projects could be going? And there are thousands, tens of thousands of projects that have been funded and that they've taken a cut on. And the idea, not just of Kickstarter, but of using these platforms to collect groups of people to fund something to support something financially that, yeah that is a whole technology to that, me like that is one of the biggest things of the past decade absolutely like it has democratized that kind of development and uh, obviously people have lost money on it like the, it's a risk and people have learned that lesson the hard way and it does need to be that way but there you also wouldn't have some things without that mechanism, including the game frame. And I will always be eternally grateful to all of my backers to who supported me for that period. And it was because that technology existed that I could make that happen. It's had its dark sides. There are, mm-hmm. the, its use as a pre-order system and the ways it's been gamified. Yep. Is, I don't think we're, we've gotten, we're past that yet. Uh, broken promises, failed Kickstarters, a lot of you know this, this uh, unsatisfied customers. Un- undoubtedly, uh, it's it's brought and it's turned garage companies into big businesses. You know, <laughs> Oculus <laughs> being a Kickstarter project, right? There you go, right? Right, Shark Tank before Shark Tank. Uh, but dude, and, that that was not a, a scam. Like that was no. that was Palmer Lucky on Kickstarter, and yeah, he got some backing once the Kickstarter took off, and it became something big. But like they delivered, they delivered as Oculus well before they were bought by Facebook. 
And I think the cousins of those platforms also GoFundMe, you know, the, the way people support each other yep. and support causes uh, and fundraise. Uh, also, uh, investment has been democratized in that way. So not necessarily we're talking about like Robin Hood, but it's the way startups have now offered. I think other ocean, right? Uh, yeah. You, you can invest yeah, in a company. Support. It was the same way getting, that yeah. Double Fine funded, uh, you know, God, what was the name of the of the adventure game? Yeah, uh, the, the Broken Age, the chal- uh, Broken Age, not the yeah. Chalice one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I think that's all born out of the increased interconnectivity and in the apps and all that ties to, to social media. So we've seen, and we I, can't I, forget I, about Patreon amidst all of this. Too. Pa- there you go, Patreon. I think a flag a flagship example. Um, social media, which I think we can include streaming in that from Twitch. To, you know, back then we had we had Twitter. Yes, we had Twitter. We had Facebook. We had MySpace, I suppose. But now it's you know, I, I think about phenomena like Turntable FM, and why people are gravitated to that, like HQ trivia, and why we all gravitated <laughs> that for for that moment. That was a great right? fad. What a wonderful that was a fun fad. moment but, that was. And the fads tapped into something that we all wanted from these services that maybe the other ones weren't providing. Uh, and some took off. Shorter form, automated playback, highly cure, high, highly pro- programmatic playback in TikTok. Obviously one of the biggest biggest uh, stories in the world to uh, most more recently, the, the Be Real stuff. Which I have, I'm not even aware of, you know, until, until it was mentioned on SNL, I wasn't even really aware of it. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. I'm still blown away by like the return to uh, the social media of my youth um, with like discord being the modern form of a BBS come, come back to life. Um, And I'm on like, I don't know, like eight discords that are all like hobby based, which really remind me of the old BBS days. So Uh, it won't be like push and pull. It won't be the same until discord lets one person on at a time. (laughs) It won't be the same until my dad yells at me for <laughs> clogging up the phone line. Or until like IRC, you need to know your long digit number and not your, your yeah. handle. You can know your, your user number. Uh, and then one of the things, some of the things we've had a lot of fun, of course, on the podcast talking about is the the pop, the, the pop culture of it all. Uh, you know, became a massive segment for us. Some of the things we love talking about as fans of pop culture, as fans of the resurgence and the rise of streaming and then just the overflowing of content uh, that has been generated out there, for better or worse, that what, whatever that word means. Uh, but Star Wars coming back happened this past decade. Star Trek resurging going through it ups and downs with smoothies and now in, in, in another golden age, uh, Marvel, they made it Marvel, of course. Yeah. Oh, those glory years where Thanos was on top. It was, <laughs> it was immaculate gentlemen. I mean that Marvel is the movie story of the past decade. That's incredible. What you guys have been able to enjoy. <laughs> Thanks, Sherry. <laughs> I, I, I hear you there. Uh, <laughs> And, and and the the last couple of trends, the things that we've talked about these this past year, uh, NFTs. So no, too no. soon to tell. Yeah, yeah, NFTs. We didn't get it at the start. <laughs> we still don't get it now. That's where we are in that. Yeah. Norm's um, Bitcoin. What a saga. That oh, that little my guy. <laughs> yes. Yes. I still wish I kept it. Sold it too early. Where is Bitcoin right now? 19 19k how about that okay all mm-hmm. right all right it's still a lot more than what i sold it for yeah <laughs> uh and uh ai art uh something that we've been talking about these past uh, the past couple months as well uh very very early days for that but also something that we really feels like will change the world before we know it yep i i appreciate that you remember that all the technology i'm gonna remember the stupid stuff too uh the uh vertical brick um, uh, one of my favorite uh, uh, bits. Uh, uh, I'm going to remember trying to explain the warping of space and time with a balloon on set. That was a mistake. Um, like, there's all sorts of just silly stuff. Uh, there's also a lot of serious stuff. Uh, uh, we we learned about viruses. 
a whole lot. Uh, I I would not be surprised if most listeners first heard about COVID nineteen from our podcast because that's where I first learned of it. I I know I've never said this, but um, there was a day uh, that I remoted in, um, and it was uh, in early March, and. Uh, it was the one where I was like, I be prepared for like disruptions in your life. And like soon thereafter, the lockdowns hit. And I have never like I tried to really be calm and poised, like all the science communication training was kicking in. I haven't been that scared in a long time. I was remote because I got sent home from work because of a potential exposure to this virus. And I was I, and I had seen some like charts and diagrams and heard from some epidemiologists that were were tracking some stuff that just terrified me. And I was like, how do I convey that this is a massive deal? And in, in the shortest possible language, knowing that there's so much uncertainty. And I remember just trying as hard as I could to convey that and kind of keep it together. But I was pretty freaked out that day. Um, I won't forget that very much because I remember um, being like, let me dial in. Norm's like, oh, it's going to be a pain. I'm like, oh, come on, let me do it. (laughs) It's important. Uh, That was a lot. And covering COVID from the start um, was a lot. And I appreciate the listeners that put so much trust in me. All like I hundreds, if not uh, nearly thousands of DMs from people that just ask for advice and I appreciate how uh, I'm just a stranger to all those people, but they listen to us and formed a relationship with us and trusted enough just to ask questions. It was um, really meaningful. Absolutely. And and thank you, Kishore, for that, for those many moments of science. I Uh, still think the parrot with the sunglasses was the best thing that like flying through the laser field and they had to equip it with a (laughs) 3D printed sunglasses glasses so it yeah, protected right. eyes yes still yes. the best thing i ever got yeah, yeah uh jeremy thank you for your the things that annoy you <laughs> the second I, I always enjoyed i know i'm sorry i made you write down on the notes app in your phone the things that annoyed you for, for a while i uh, have but, uh, you saved me from i can't count the hundreds of dollars in therapy that that would have <laughs> resulted in i that was absolutely for my better good and i appreciate that <laughs> the outlet thank you um, and I did want to also, of course, thank all the contributors uh, and guests that we've had over the years who have been able to fill a seat here and there. Uh, God, there's so in, many in names. Studio. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Uh, obviously, uh, Gary and Will, who are yep. on here, but like Veronica Belmont was on the show a bunch. Uh, yep. Patrick uh, Norton. Uh, Sean was on the show. Zach mm-hmm. Radding was on the show a bunch yeah, of Mike, times. Micah, uh, Steve Lynn. Uh, on the show, you know, lots of friends, lot, lot, some people we, we met through the podcast uh, were able to, to join us uh, from time to time. And um, yeah, I, I, we did one, we, we did the podcast live once at PAX in 2011, I want to say, with Will, Gary, and I on the stage. And I did not enjoy that experience at all. Um, and I gotta say, like, I like the podcast being just the three of us. Uh, I think we had the one time we had a, we had a visitor to our studio and <laughs> that was the weirdest day. That was the weirdest day. He sat in the corner and sat watched in the us corner and me. watched us for the podcast. Um, <laughs> it was fun to go through the experience. Uh, and then of course, uh, so many of you as listeners who generated outros for us for the longest time, if you're a new listener to the show, uh, one, sorry, <laughs> you'll have to find another feed. Uh, but also, uh, the uh, uh, for the longest time on the old site, we had a uh, template that you could download and generate a clip. And we had some real MVPs who generated uh, outros on a regular basis from Just- Justin, aka Speed, to Black Powder Engine, and Great Job, who was still generating outros as, uh, as late as last week. Uh, thank you guys so much for uh, for loving the show, uh, saving all the stupid shit we say, and letting making us listen to it back for the first time live on, on at the end of the shows. I remember uh, 
you know, this show hasn't been the same since we haven't been able to do it in person and life has just sort of gotten in the way of us doing it in person. Um, but I remember being in that room and it's this tiny room, our old set in the tested office. It's a closet. And we, we came out one day and Adam's like, yep, smells like a podcast coming out of there. And like, I just remember that because it was like, it was funny. And then we went to lunch and I was like, yep, that's what the (laughs) podcast was. It's like turning on those weird lights, hanging out, chatting about whatever we chatted about. Then we'd go have lunch and just talk about stuff. And it was um, one of the best parts of the week. I'm going to miss it dearly. And even though it hasn't been the same, it's still been great over Zoom. And um, uh, I can't thank both of you enough. Uh, so obviously what's next we're not gonna have the the podcast feed i believe will stay up for a little bit but uh if you if there are, if for any reason you want to download old episodes do it now <laughs> do it they're now also for, all on youtube or most yes, of them are that's right YouTube. yes and those videos will stay up on youtube of course uh and uh and just like when we uh, uh retired still entitled as a podcast, gosh, over a year now, and we focused on doing more live streams. We're going to do some more live streams instead. So, uh, one of the ways I'll, I'm always going to look for an outlet to to chat and catch up with folks, and I'll be jumping on some live streams, uh, hopefully on a, a very least a monthly basis. Uh, nights and weekends work best for me. So, I may catch me on a live stream on the channel, building a model kit, catching up with some of our members, uh, and and thank the members as well of course, uh, on the YouTube channel for supporting us. Um, that's it. What a run. 668, maybe, episodes of This Is Only a Test. I'll give you a little bit of insight. Uh, this podcast was almost called This Is Not a Test. And I said, Will, how about This Is Only a Test? And that's why it's called This Is Only a Test. Like and- this is Like this is a drill it was supposed to be – like this urgent is not a test yeah yeah yeah, right, yeah. Right. like ah, but we are a test we are tested <laughs> so how about this is only a test nice <laughs> nice tweak the official podcast of tested.com one last time uh let's have an outro this one comes from the archives from justin aka speed and oh I didn't even mention all the intros we're gonna we're gonna wrap up listening to this and we'll do what we something we haven't done since the early early days of the tested podcast which is have a f- fake outtake and i want to play <laughs> for you kishore and jamry if you'll bear with me some of the, our favorite intro music pieces from over the weirs, years maybe we'll go backwards in time and have some of the recent ones and we'll, we'll wrap up and end with the very first intro i think the very first intro piece that we had for this open for that here is an outro hi there i didn't see you tested But this is going to be a terrible camera. Our soul's in the machine now. All right, it took a picture. Yeah. Uh, it looks so sad. Now when, we we, now when we die, we go straight to hell. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that was Jibo. Oh, funny. See you on the other side, Jibo. Jibo! <laughs> right. Here we go. I have a, a folder pulled up. These are some intros. We did a contest two years ago uh oh of, that's uh, right uh, to for for listeners to generate music themes for us i believe it was one of the peaks of our podcast here's here's one i think you're gonna like this one we had a series of metal themes oh, yeah. these are made for kashore i think by request specific by request yeah and this might have been our favorite one here we go Not bad. That wasn't the first one. This is our favorite one. This is it. That was pretty good. I, I really got one. That was from who was that? Oh, Mass Kill. Mass Kill. 
Yes, mass kill. Great job. Okay, this is one. This would have been our. So we end up with less reverb made the theme, that the more, our most recent theme, and this one was from Mark Scaruto. I never learned how to pronounce his name, but you may remember the music. Oh, uh, great one. brought back some memories uh, of course we when will left tested uh and and the show as a regular host uh we did have him come back from time to time and one of the ways we mark that occasion was we'd have the very first theme of the podcast remixed for something that was all the rage at the time and it was of course dubstep so here's the dubstep version <laughs> Right. <laughs> Look at that fucking squirrel on my bird feeder. And then suddenly, the Enterprise D's bridge. That was a reference to Star Trek, the experience uh, in one of our outros or fake outros that we had. I got two more to play. This one, I don't even remember. It was made by Impromptu Parade, but it's in my main podcast music folder. And it's called This Is Only a Test Redux. So uh, I'll see if you remember this one. I'm not sure we ever really used. I think one. you snuck in one. Yeah, that that one, that one sneaked into the folder. Okay, and then uh, this uh, is a shortened version of the main theme that we had that we started the podcast on 12 years ago with episode one. It's a shorter version, but this is what we had as our theme. That was the shorter one? That's 34 seconds. Is it? That's a long right. podcast intro. I'm going to miss hearing that every week. That was yeah, the best. We haven't heard of that one every week for, for years now, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. I, I'm going to miss hearing that. I started as a as a fan on this show, and I'm going to miss hearing it. And I should have said this a long time ago. This is just an awesome, awesome experience. Thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Jeremy, Kishore, listeners out there. Uh, and that's it. We're going to sign off for the last time. Don't be sad, guys. Life after the podcast is glorious. <laughs> you, go, you, you get all this new time. You, you don't have to worry in the hours preceding the podcast about what you're going to say. It's like a whole new world. It's, you're, free to, you're free again. And go out into the world and do great things. Bring everything you've learned from this podcast and <laughs> Share with others in new ways. And then if you want to come back, there's always Patreon (laughs) and Twitter, and we'll get it done. You don't understand, Jeremy. I have no other marketable skills. (laughs)